In order to get a PCOS diagnosis, you have to meet only two out of three criteria, elevated levels of androgens. And those are male sex hormones like testosterone, DHEA. And that can cause things like facial hair, um, body hair growth, acne, hair loss on the head. You could also just have the physical manifestations of that. So just have those symptoms. So that's number one. Um, number two are irregular periods. You could also have your period be completely just, just ghost you and it's MIA, or you could feel like you're bleeding all the time. So there's no one clear pattern for irregular periods, but those all point to the same thing, which is anovulation. And then the third one is polycystic ovaries, and that can only be seen on an ultrasound. That being said, that's why it can be so confusing because, you know, a woman will come to me saying, well, I don't, I, I know I don't have PCOS because my period is irregular. Well, you could meet the other two diagnostic criteria and still have it. Hey, this is Chad Namiro. And I'm Kelly Namiro. Welcome to the Balancing Chaos Podcast. A lifestyle podcast where we will interview guests about wellness, business, and just about everything in between. Our goal is to help you develop a lifestyle that promotes health, wholeness, and success. Through our conversations, we hope to inspire you to live a beautiful, full, and joyful life as you navigate balancing the chaos. We hope you enjoy. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Balancing Chaos podcast. We're super excited to be here today with Corey Ruth. Today, we are going to talk all about food, hormones, and how they interact together. Corey has dedicated her career to empowering women by unraveling the intricate connection between their body systems and optimal health. Her personal journey with PCOS ignited a fire within her to become a beacon of knowledge and support for other women facing similar challenges. With a master's degree in nutritional science and a commitment to evidence-based nutrition, Corey guides her clients through a labyrinth of PCOS management, empowering them to regain control of their health, weight, and fertility. Corey resides in California and Oregon. We'll talk about that with her fiance, two lovely kids, and a puppy. And she finds solace in cooking, hiking, and keeping house plants. Today, she is joining us with her expertise and insights on navigating the complexities of PCOS and embracing holistic health and well-being. Please give me some help in giving a warm welcome to Corey Ruth. Welcome to the show. Thank you. I have one correction. It's actually oh. killing, it's killing house plants that I oh, killing house really, plants. really good at. Yeah. <laughs> keeping, keeping not so much killing. Yes. I love it. I to uh, I'm mm -hmm. with you oh, on that one. I'm very day. bad at it. What were you going to say? That I've killed a few bonsai trees in my day. Yeah, seriously. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that it's always really incredible when you start a business out of your own journey. I know that's what what I did. So talk to us a little bit about your experience. Um, when you found out you had PCOS, did you? I don't really define it. Well, yeah, let's we'll define it. But I just want to ask, like, were you trying to get pregnant, or like, how did you find that out? So PCOS stands for Polycystic Ovary Syndrome, and mm -hmm. it is the leading cause of infertility, but it's also the most common endocrine condition worldwide. So researchers estimate about 10 to 15% of women of reproductive age have it. Okay. And it's just not talked about enough. And it's a very complex condition. There can be a gynecological component. There can be an endocrine. There can be a metabolic component. So mm -hmm. a lot of times doctors don't quite know where to place us. And we kind of can fall through the cracks as a result. So one of the, a very common PCOS symptom is having irregular periods, irregular menstrual cycles. And I quickly realized, I think in high school that mine was not normal. I heard my girlfriends in the locker room talking about when, oh yeah, my period is going to be here on Friday. And I was like, what? Like, how do you know that? Mine would just go MIA for months and then it would stick around for weeks and then it would just pop in randomly to say what's up. So I <laughs> kind of felt like I something was wrong with me um, and I didn't know what it was. And I just kind of pushed it to the back of my, you know, to the back burner. I was busy. I was going through school. I was going through grad school. I was working, doing my thing. And um, I got diagnosed in my early 20s, but I kind of had an idea that I had it before then. When you were going through it and like kind of found out that you had the diagnosis, was your diet different than it is now? Oh yeah. Okay. And I, when I was in college, I gained about 50 pounds and I, um, of course that was also fueled by beer pong and late night burritos and all of the things that, um, you know, previous to my dietitian life, 
And I felt like just a stranger in my own body. I was placed on every type of birth control under the sun. Mm -hmm. um, and I did not like me personally. I did not feel my best on any of them. And I really pushed back on that. Um, but my PCOS really flared when and I, I just, I felt fatigued. I felt I had no confidence. It was just a low time in my life physically. And I started to learn a little bit more about PCOS actually kind of as I was going through grad school and becoming a dietitian and on that path already. Mm. And once I really started to understand and dive into some of the research, I started to realize what a huge connection there is between diet and nutrition mm -hmm. and PCOS. It's huge. That connection. I mean, they are BFFs blood yeah. sugar balance and PCOS. And, you know, as a dietitian, we learn all about blood sugar balance and we're talking about diabetes care. So yeah. I had a, you know, a big knowledge base there already. And I started to think, oh my gosh, these two are so, they're so linked together. Usually when I see a client myself who has PCOS, like our first mm -hmm. conversation is yeah. insulin resistance and blood sugar management. Um, mm -hmm. But before we get into that, because yeah. this is such a common condition. And I'm guessing it's probably more common in the United States than it is in other areas of the world, just because of what our diet looks like versus um, mm -hmm. people who eat more real whole food. And I think that what happens is that a lot of people walk around not feeling so great, having these irregular periods, but not knowing that it's PCOS. So can you talk mm -hmm. to about one, how you get diagnose, like, yeah. because I know that there's some cr different criteria that you have to meet. And then two, what are some of the symptoms that you had? Um, you mentioned fatigue before you got diagnosed that you can now correlate with having PCOS. Sure. So in order to get a PCOS diagnosis, you have to meet only two out of three criteria. So one of them is to have elevated levels of androgens. And those are male sex hormones like testosterone, DHEA. And that can cause things like facial hair, um, body hair growth, acne, hair loss on the head. You could also just have the physical manifestations of that. So just have those symptoms. So that's number one. So either lab work or physical symptoms of elevated androgens. Um, number two are irregular periods. So when I say irregular, you know, that doesn't mean that your period comes every 28 days and then it's 29 days or 27. This is, you know, I'm talking about 17 days in between a cycle or a bleed, eight, then the next month, 84, um, mm -hmm. you know, and so on and so forth. You could also have your period be completely just, just ghost you and it's MIA, or you could feel like you're bleeding all the time. So there's no one clear pattern for irregular periods, but those all point to the same thing, which is an ovulation. Mm -hmm. So you're not ovulating regularly, which we should be doing as women every, every month. And then the third one is polycystic ovaries. And that can only be seen on an ultrasound. I want to clarify that though, because we hear cysts. And we think of like big, painful ovarian cysts, you know, these women say, oh, I had the, I had a grapefruit sized cyst and it burst. And I went to the ER from the pain. You can have that, but that's not caused by PCOS. The cysts and PCOS are actually not cysts. They're what they are, are tiny, immature, underdeveloped follicles. And how I describe them is they're all competing to ovulate and nobody's winning. So when mm. you look at an ultrasound, you see this, what we call a string of pearls, all these little tiny cysts kind of popping up. Um, so that's the third piece. So that being said, that's why it can be so confusing because, you know, a woman will come to me saying, well, I don't, I, I know I don't have PCOS because my periods are regular. Well, you could meet the other two diagnostic criteria and still have it. So it gets a little hairy, kind of yeah. a little confusing when we're talking about who has PCOS and who doesn't. And symptoms can really overlap, right? Like somebody who has a thyroid condition can also have irregular periods. So now we're looking at more of sort of this diagnosis of exclusion, like, okay, let's exclude, you know, let's make sure we rule out any thyroid issue. Right. Um, so symptoms that are common with PCOS include irregular periods. That's a big tip off those symptoms of elevated androgens. So facial hair, body hair growth, we're going to notice that hair loss on the head. We see a lot of the like androgenic, like hair thinning around the temples. Don't look at me. I'm postpartum. And then we also see acne um, and that can be on the body as well. And then weight gain. Weight gain is a huge piece. There is this huge connection between our hormones and weight gain and our ability to lose weight more easily. So that's really tied to hormones like insulin and cortisol. 
um, fatigue, energy level issues, cravings, a lot of like hardcore sugar, carb cravings. That's that blood sugar piece coming in. Women with PCOS have three times higher risk of anxiety and depression. So we see a lot of mood issues and that makes perfect sense, right? If our hormones are all over the map. Um, and we don't know what's going on with our period, you know, that, that mood component can be so huge. Right. So those are some of the things that, you know, that really pop up and manifest. Is nutrition the the primary and probably not the singular, but the overwhelmingly uh, primary driver of PCOS? And then give us a sense, you know, just mathematically how common this is, you know, one out of every 10. I think you said 10%, right? 10 to 15%. 10 to 15 percent. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So researchers don't fully understand the exact etiology. We don't know exactly what causes PCOS. Some of us think that there is a genetic component. Mm -hmm. We know that women uh, or daughters of women with PCOS have a seven to eight times higher risk of having PCOS too. So there could be that genetic link. And a lot of us, you know, this hasn't been studied extensively up and, you know, now we're just starting to study it more. So we could have grandmothers that had it and never knew. Mm -hmm. um, there could be an insulin resistance connection. Not everybody who has PCOS has that classically defined insulin resistance piece, but for many of us, that is a factor. Can you and, define really quickly just before continuing? Because yeah, um, I think sure. that just so we have clarity, what is insulin resistance? Yeah, that's a really good question. Yeah. So basically a good way to describe it, your blood sugar is being regulated, right? It's being regulated all the time. Mm -hmm. When our body is bombarded with too much excess glucose, insulin, our insulin levels rise and we can't, and we can no longer get those, those hormones efficiently into our bloodstream. So mm -hmm. they build up and accumulate and your body becomes resistant to insulin. It's, it's like insulin's knocking and nobody's listening. Right. So it's kind of, um, it builds up and then we get this, this inability to be able to maintain that. Mm -hmm. Um, and it can lead to all kinds of issues when it comes to weight cravings, you know, um, all the other issues that we just talked about. I think one of the controversial things when it comes to PCOS is, mm -hmm. especially because of the fact that it is such a big driver of infertility is, mm -hmm. is this reversible? Because I've had clients who have gone into fertility clinics with the diagnosis of PCOS and the doctor says, no, you're going to have to do IUI or like a stimulated cycle or IVF. And then mm -hmm. I mean, I know that personally clients who I've worked with mm -hmm. who have reversed the insulin resistance, mm -hmm. they start ovulating again, they start having regular cycles and they've gotten pregnant. And so yeah. give us your sense of, is this reversible? Sure. So there is no cure for PCOS, but symptoms can be managed. And PCOS is something that we do have to continuously manage. It's not like we can take a, you know, a seven day pack of antibiotics and then we're good to go. Once that your client, once they stop paying attention to how they're eating and how they're regulating their blood sugar, how they're managing their stress, what's going to come back with a vengeance, their PCOS symptoms. So yes, you can put symptoms into remission, but you have to be continuously working on that. It's, it's a, it's a lifelong journey. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Almost like how diabetes can be like for some people can be managed with diet. Right. It's like you have to be really yes. intentional and, and focused on it. That makes sense. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. I wish there was a, a cure <laughs> <laughs> that magic pill. <laughs> What's, I'd the be out of business. what's the yeah. exact correlation with infertility? Is it the inability to mm -hmm. ovulate? Yeah, or is it the inability question. for the egg to actually uh, grow in the follicle? Great question. So the reason why PCOS is the leading cause of infertility is because of that anovulation piece. Okay. If we can get you ovulating, you have just as much of a chance as anybody else to get pregnant, barring, you know, there are other issues at play, like even on the male side of things, yeah. um, if that's your only issue. Yeah. Mm. Mm -hmm. Okay. But yeah. It doesn't affect um, egg quality or anything like that. So for the women that you work with, when it comes yeah. to your approach. I think that Chad kind of begged this question a little bit, but like to kind of make sure that we're fully unraveling it is your main focus nutrition. And if that is the case, like what are, let's say three really good tips that one of our listeners could take away. If they're like, I know I have this and I don't mm -hmm. want to have to like go on birth control, or I don't want to have to 
go to an IVF clinic? Like, what can I start to do on my own? Totally. Yeah. So the first thing that you want to talk about, which is like the world's least sexy subject, but we've already touched on it a little bit. So (laughs) it is blood sugar balance. And that is because there is a direct connection there. When our blood sugar is not regulated, it sends messages down to our ovaries to pump out more androgens like testosterone. And that will make our PCOS symptoms worse. That will, you know, potentially impact our ability to get pregnant or lose weight or whatever, you know, health goal that we have. So we really want to focus on that. And there's, you know, a ton of ways to do that, but, um, just, you know, a a quick tip is to make sure that you are prioritizing protein, fat, and fiber, Mm -hmm. and you don't need to eliminate carbohydrates. That's not what we are. It's not what I mean, but we are being more mindful of our carb consumption because we do live in this very kind of carb centric food society and we are all about convenience. And, um, a lot of times we fall short in, as far as the other macronutrients go. Right. So limiting our carbs, not eliminating them, but making sure we're getting ample protein and fiber is a huge one. Fiber helps to balance your blood sugar. Mm-hmm. And so many Americans do not get enough fiber. I was, I was reading something the other day that yeah. was saying like 13% of Americans get enough fiber a day, <laughs> yes. which I even like when I work with people, it's like, you look at their food logs and you're like, Oh my yeah. gosh, you might be getting like seven grams of fiber a day. So yeah, <laughs> I hear you on. <laughs> yeah. My bowels would be shot, but that's another story. So yeah, you definitely want to get that fiber. You want to get 25 to 35 grams of fiber. My recommendation kind of general Mac down, Mac down, <laughs> macro breakdown would be about 35% of your diet. Um, what you're eating is, is protein. Mm-hmm. And again, that balances your blood sugar that sets your hormones up to be in the happiest state possible. Um, number two, don't skip so, breakfast. Sorry, yeah. really quickly before we yeah. move on. Cause I think that like so many different people have a different approach, but it sounds like you and I yeah. are really aligned on this in terms of like what we tell people. So yeah. for you, if you're saying, okay, 35% of your diet should come from protein. Does that look the same? Like, are you consistently telling women like get 90 grams of protein a day? Or is it like, you are this weight, we're going to tell you this is for for you specifically, how many grams? Yes, it it will depend on the person because someone who is 5'11 and 275 pounds is going to have a different caloric need than somebody who's 5'2 and 115. So that percentage can be applied across the board, which is why I like to use it. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Do you see any correlation in the data in terms of like vegans versus someone that would be on like the carnivore diet? Like do mm-hmm. you see any one of any number of those being more effective in treating or avoiding PCOS symptoms? Yeah, we do see generally um it can be harder to keep carb count down when someone is fully vegan because most of their protein sources do include carbs versus versus somebody who incorporates, you know, yeah. things like fish or eggs or, you know, where there's virtually no carbohydrates. Um, that being said though, they do tend to eat more fiber. So it's kind of, it depends. It depends on how they're doing it. And a lot of women are going about vegan diets, not really understanding, okay, I need to supplement with vitamin B12. I need to do this. I need to do this. So they're, they're not working with somebody who can guide them effectively. And that's another problem. Um, the carnivore diet, I, yeah, the fiber piece there, we got to get that fiber up. Um, fiber actually helps the body detoxify estrogen. So we excrete estrogen out through our feces. And so fiber helps to kind of bind and, and get it out. So we really want to be mindful of fiber intake as women, um, especially if we have hormonal imbalances and we we're dealing with some kind of hormonal issue like PCOS. So one of the things that you were saying, I want to let you continue that point was like the second yeah. point you were making was not skipping breakfast. And so we've had a lot of people on this podcast Mm -hmm. and most of them who recommend intermittent fasting Uh are men. Um, (laughs) And all of the research about intermittent fasting has been done on men. So can you talk a little bit about why that piece is not, is important? About, yeah, about intermittent fasting. Why you shouldn't, yeah. Why you Um, shouldn't get breakfast. 
Yeah. So, so breakfast, if you think about the word breakfast, you're literally breaking a fast, right? You're going a really long time without eating. So what you want to do is you want to put something in your body to give you fuel. And what that does is it stabilizes your blood sugar, depending on what it is. If breakfast to you means, um, a bagel with cream cheese and a venti coffee, you know, from Starbucks that's loaded with 53 grams of sugar, then, you know, that's another story. But if you're getting a breakfast in that has ample protein and fiber, um, eggs, avocado, and, um, you know, whatever smoothie with chia seeds and protein in it, that sets your blood sugar off on the right foot. Mm -hmm. And that's what you want to do when you have PCOS. And that can also help to sustain your energy levels throughout the whole rest of the day. You know, we talk a lot about breakfast and metabolism and that is, that can be true too, but I'm kind of specifically talking more about PCOS. Um, so yeah, don't skip breakfast and someone who says they're not hungry in the morning for breakfast, the majority of the time is because they're overdoing it for their last meal of the day and their body's still processing that. So my recommendation would be to pare that dinner meal down to essentially make room to be hungry in the morning. It's a good sign when you wake up hungry. It's actually a good sign yeah. when we're talking about your adrenals and your cortisol, you want that. So pare down that dinner meal, stop making dinner like this gigantic meal and eat, eat smaller meals and snacks throughout the day. I was literally going to say that a lot of times not having an appetite in the morning is a sign of adrenal issues. Can you go into why yeah. that might be the case? Yeah. So your adrenals, um, and I'm kind of talking about cortisol here. Cortisol is our stress hormone mm -hmm. and, um, your adrenals also make other things like DHEA and other uh, androgens, but, um, but cortisol is helping to, um, cortisol is not all bad. Some, we need some amount of cortisol, right? If you think about back in the day, we're running from like a, whatever it is, like, Willie Mac or something, yeah. the a tiger. Yeah. And that cortisol puts us in that fight or flight mode. That's we need that spike, but too much is also a bad thing because it can make us basically, it slows our metabolism down, makes our body want to hold on to weight and not let it go. It basically steals progesterone. Our body wants to make cortisol instead of progesterone, which we need. So we need cortisol and we need, we should be producing the most cortisol actually first thing in the morning, because that that's our get up and go juice. That's what's going to kind of push us through the rest of the day. So that adrenal connection, it can be that, you know, our adrenals are not so happy with us if we're not getting that normal stress response in the morning. So when I say stress, stress is not all bad. I remember a time in my life when springtime would hit and immediately I would be searching for a new trainer or Googling all of the seven day juice cleanse, 14 day detoxes so that I could get myself in shape for summer. And what I didn't realize at this time was that all of that was a complete waste of my time, of my energy, of my resources. And I look back on that, just wishing for those hours and all of that energy and brain power back. The decisions that I was making for my body were coming from a place of punishment rather than from a place of love. And it wasn't until I started meditating and I started doing the work, the real work on myself that I recognized that I needed to nourish my body with both movement and food and mindset work if I ever wanted my body to love me back in a sustainable way. And that's why the WBK membership that I release meditations where I deeply connect you with yourself and blood sugar balancing recipes to nourish you on a cellular level and low impact movement to support the delicate balance of your hormones really gets you the results that you're looking for where it starts to become a lifestyle. It starts to become who you are. I can tell you firsthand that both myself and my members, my private clients, all of us have seen the most incredible results from the WBK method. It's so different than your typical diet and a restrictive approach that we're taught from diet culture from a very early age. As a 33 year old mom of two, this is the leanest I've ever been the most energy that I've ever had and the best that I have ever felt in my freaking body. And it can be that way for you too. So right now with the code balancing chaos, all one word, B-A-L-A-N-C-I-N-G, 
C-H-A-O-S. You can get 10% off your annual membership for the WBK method and get new weekly content, plus a library of hundreds of workouts, recipes, meditations with a seven day reset and a 30 day challenge all to get you started. So use the code balancing chaos, again, all one word to start your seven day free trial and see when you love your body back, how your body starts to love you. One of the things that you mentioned was how fiber helps us to detoxify excess estrogen. We know that like estrogen plays a role in other, you know, hormonal issues and, um, Mm -hmm. you know, female issues like endometriosis. Does estrogen dominance play a role Mm -hmm. in PCOS? And I, I know the answer to this, but I would like to hear what you have to say about that. Yeah. So, um, typically what happens with PCOS isn't, we don't see so much estrogen dominance. What we see is that women aren't often ovulating. So they're not producing progesterone. Progesterone is the yin to estrogen's yang. We want to be producing progesterone for about half of our cycle. So we only produce progesterone after ovulation. So when we're not ovulating, what we have is not estrogen that's too high. It's what we call unopposed estrogen. Right. Estrogen just hanging out, flying wild, and we have no progesterone to balance it out and basically be that yin and yang. So it's not so much like estrogen dominance. It's more, um, we just have it and we don't have progesterone to kind of keep it in check. No, like progest, almost like progesterone deficiency is like a way that that's how I describe it. So yeah, I think that's helpful, a helpful way to look at it for sure. Mm -hmm. Totally. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> this is a hard one for Chad. I feel like because there's less for him to to talk yeah, about. So, <laughs> so you have two kids. I do. Now you mentioned first. You mentioned being on the birth control pill. Let's go there for a minute, yeah. and then we'll talk about um getting pregnant and kind of like how that happened for you. Um, yeah. when you were on the birth control pill, you mentioned that it didn't work for you. I think a lot of women who have PCOS, Mm -hmm. if they go to a Western doctor, that's the option that they're given. This is going to quote unquote regulate (laughs) your cycle. (laughs) But the reality reality is, is that it's not regulating anything. It's shutting down your entire um, hormonal system and the way that your brain communicates with your ovaries. Um, And I think that there's a lot more education on this topic now. I think that like back when I was put on birth control for over a decade, it was like, I didn't know. I just thought, yeah, like this was regulating my cycle, but then I got off and then my period was still missing. From your perspective, is birth control a solution? And what is that really doing for us? If that's what we're told to do? Yeah, that that is the common solution. And it's kind of a band-aid solution because yes, it can make you feel more normal, right? We're getting a bleed every 28-ish days. But it, it essentially is shutting down your sex hormones and replacing them with, with synthetic hormones. So um, birth control can, can accomplish some of those things, right? It can help to alleviate some of our symptoms temporarily, mm-hmm. but it doesn't do anything to fix what's driving our hormonal issues. Mm-hmm. It's, it's not addressing those. And the, a problem that I commonly see is that women get on birth control Young women. I mean, birth. My my cousin who's fourteen um, was offered birth control by her doctor recently for yeah for period cramps. So if we're put on birth control at fourteen and we're on birth control until we're whatever thirty two, we get married, we want to have kids, and then we come off of it. And all of a sudden, all these symptoms just come like they hit us like a tidal wave. It's, it's, it kind of does us a disservice, right? Because it's not teaching us how to get in tune with our body, how to understand our own hormonal rhythms and allow the, allowing us to kind of troubleshoot. Is there anything off and how do I fix it? So yeah, definitely um, the most common treatment approach, but I always like to remind women that it's not the only approach to caring for your body and your PCOS. There are so many things that we can do from a dietary and lifestyle standpoint, and, you know, not just diet, stress management, easier said than done. I know, um, exercise and movement humans are not meant to be sedentary. And yet, you know, here we are all the time sitting, um, indoors all the time, um, gut health, sleep, 
supplements. There's so many things we can be doing outside of the pill or, you know, whatever birth control, whatever hormonal birth control. Mm -hmm. Um, and there's so many side effects that can come with birth control. You know, I experienced a huge shifts in my appetite and as a result, weight gain and my blood sugar was all over the place. Um, mood swings, uh, loss of libido. Yes. I remember going to the doctor, I was in college yeah. and I was put on the Nuva ring at one point. Mm -hmm. And, um, I went to the doctor because my libido had completely disappeared and she literally like laughed at me and brushed it off. Like it didn't matter. And I'm like, this is such a great example of how, you know, women's concerns are not taken seriously as if like, I didn't need a sex drive. It didn't, didn't matter that that wasn't there. Yeah. So um, there's so many side effects that we don't even talk about. Yeah. So that's my spiel. I love that you brought that up because I think that yeah. there's so many women out there who don't know that like the birth control pill that they're taking. Like I had another client who said the exact same thing to me the other day. Like I've been taking this now for five years and like, I have zero sex drive and I'm like, mm. well, one, we can look at your stress, but two, like, look at what you're taking every single day. Like right. that's going to obviously have a huge impact. Same thing with like gut health. Like so many women don't mm -hmm. know that this pill that they're taking every day is influencing mm -hmm. their microbiome and right. the good versus bad bacteria that are growing there. And so I think that so What's true. really needed is just more education around it. So people can make an informed decision versus just being told 100%. like by their doctor, that's the only option. Totally. Yeah. And it's fascinating to even see the research studies that show that women choose partners, um, different partners while they're on birth control than off. And you know, like how that can impact who we're potentially like choosing as a partner, like sexually or romantically. It's just fascinating. And we're doing more research on that, which is so needed. Yeah. 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 I think that that that's, that is fascinating. Like yeah. there's so many different side effects and things like that. And like, yeah, like it's just, it has to be talked about more. And so, um, one of the things that you brought up was, uh, supplements. And so for somebody yeah. who is, who wants to do everything that's in their power and they know that this is their diagnosis, I'm not recommending that anyone who doesn't have a diagnosis take supplements without knowing, but what are some things that you recommend? Sure. So supplement wise, there's so many great things out there. If you are on metformin or even prescribed metformin, um, there's two supplements that can potentially act uh, similarly that are alternatives that may have a lot less side effects that you can get without a prescription. So one of them is called Ovacetol and that's an inositol product. Mm -hmm. um, and the other one is called Berberine. And both of those are great for insulin resistance, for elevated androgens, for blood sugar balance. Those are excellent picks. Um, I have my own PCOS supplement line. So I've, you know, created some blends for specific PCOS issues. So things like zinc, saw palmetto, Hygium, these can all be helpful to help encourage lower androgen production, mm -hmm. which can help, you know, drive, improve a lot of our symptoms. Um, phosphatidylserine, uh, adaptogens, these can be helpful for cortisol and stress and that stress response, that irritability, that mood and sleep issue. Women with PCOS are at a higher risk for sleep apnea. We see more insomnia. So sleep is, you know, again, not like a super sexy subject, but it is something that's kind of the foundation of hormonal health. So we want to make sure that we're supporting good sleep, um, both quality and quantity. Uh, so that's, you know, supplements that you can take for that. Um, magnesium is an excellent one for, for mood and stress and sleep support, as well as digestion, lots of gut health issues with PCOS2, IBS. We see that a lot. Um, so that's a really good one. Gosh, there's so many good ones. I will say though, it's so funny every time I make a post on, you know, Instagram or, or whatever social media, I'll, you know, say that, say the post is, oh, um, top five tips for PCOS acne. And I've got all these, you know, dietary lifestyle things. And then I've got one supplement in there. Who want her comments about the supplement asking questions about what this supplement is yeah. like, yes, supplements are great, but supplements are supportive. You can't out supplement a really horrible diet. So you want to make sure that they are accessories to whatever you're doing. Yes. So I always, you know, try to lead with that. I should have said that first, but um, not to rely on a supplement to fix all of your problems, but they certainly can be helpful as you're going through making some of the other changes that, you know, we're talking about today. Everyone wants a magic pill. <laughs> yes. I want the magic pill. Like sign me up, but I haven't found it yet. If I, if I do find it, I'll let you know, but Seriously. so far. 
my my search has been yeah <laughs> what about like all the chemicals and plastics and everything else we've had a number of guests on the podcast yeah. talking about how those mm-hmm. are affecting I guess predominantly male hormones but do you see those as a contributing factor as well to PCOS and other things like it Totally. Yeah. Endocrine disruptors are a very hot topic right now. And, you know, as we move more and more and more towards this, like, you know, electronic, you know, heavy electronic plastic dependent society. Um, yeah, we do see that. And we've actually done some studies on PCOS in particular mm-hmm. and finding higher levels of BPA and women with PCOS inside of our bodies. Um, so there could be a component, you know, we're maybe storing more of it, absorbing more of it, whatever it is, but it's one of those things that will drive you absolutely bonkers. If you try to be perfect about, right. Yeah, like trying to go com- <laughs> yeah, <laughs> completely cut out this, 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 and this along with, you know, it, it, it can drive you nuts. So my recommendation is always to do the best you can with what you've got. Um, not, not everybody can, you know, afford all of the alternatives. So thinking about what's within your means and going from there and what you're, what you're comfortable with. So um, it's definitely, a, a, it can play a role in hormones like estrogen. That's where I've seen the most research done in um, endocrine disruptors or EDCs and women and women with PCOS. So that's a huge one as far as um, like estrogen inhibitors, estrogen mimickers. Some of these can go in and like block our natural estrogen receptors. They're sneaky and they hide in a lot of different things. So do the best you can with what you've got. But, you know, if don't feel too guilty if you're not, you know, if you haven't changed all of your cookware and all of your Tupperware and all of your shampoo and all of your nail polish. I mean, this, there's a lot. So I encourage women to go slowly and, you know, pick the big things off the list first and and go from there. So if you were to think about like, okay, like there's that, or there's like, there's diet, like which would be a Mm. bigger contributor to hormonal imbalance and to like a, a condition like this? Um, gosh, that's hard to say just because I do feel like we have so much more research on the diet and nutrition side rather, rather than the EDC side, but I would say diet just because there's also pesticides and things in our food too, right? So diet can kind of encompass that in a way, in in, in one area. Mm-hmm. So I would say nutrition probably, and a lot of the artificial ingredients and the chemicals that we find in our food now, the artificial artificial coloring and artificial sweeteners that can impact our gut health. It's so it's so vast. Mm-hmm. <laughs> there's so much. Gut health is one of those things that you've brought up a couple times, and yeah. so. Um, I know like the piece where we talked about being able to detoxify excess estrogens, right? And like mm-hmm. the way that we do that is through mm-hmm. going to the bathroom, going mm-hmm. going poop. But like yeah. what what other ways does gut health tie to or is there any other way that that ties to PCOS? Sure. Yeah. So our microbiome, we have all this bacteria in there. Some of it's, you know, air quotes, good, what we call normal commensal bacteria. And some of it is air quotes, bad opportunistic bacteria. So we've done some research looking at bacteria in the gut. And what we found is that certain bacteria can affect a lot about our bodies that we have, we've never previously fully understood. Mm -hmm. It can affect, we have this whole um, piece in there called the estrobolum, and that can impact our estrogen levels. Our gut bacteria can impact our estrogen. Our gut bacteria can impact our weight. Our gut bacteria can impact our mood. There's so many things. And um, so it's, it's definitely an emerging science. We're learning more and more about it, Mm -hmm. but what we can do is make sure that we're feeding our gut bacteria to the best of our ability. So we're getting in that fiber. They feed off of fiber. We're getting in prebiotics. We're getting in fermented foods, probiotics. Um, and we're also diversifying our diet because our gut bacteria want to eat everything under the sun. So if you're, if you're stuck in a food rut, you're eating the same breakfast every day you're eating the same snack, the same kind of lunches, your gut bacteria don't like that. They want different things. You got to mix it up. Get, if you're, you know, if you're doing smoothies in the morning, mix up the fruit week to week. So just by paying attention to those small things, we can potentially impact and help to grow, you know, the amount of good bacteria in our gut. That's super helpful. That's really interesting. What you were talking about, like, if I think about like what leads to like insulin resistance, for example, like if you're eating like white foods all day long that are Mm -hmm. like pasta, bagels, Mm -hmm. um, bread, Mm -hmm. pizza, like, yeah, 
you're not feeding those right. good bacteria. So it's kind of like a cyclical yes. thing that happens. Right. right? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, exactly. That's- yeah. You're starving your good bacteria essentially while also creating problems with your blood sugar. Yeah. yeah. It's really that sounds like me in college. Yes. <laughs> Same. The bagel. Everyone. Yeah. Good time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> good time. Okay. So we talked about like br- the birth control aspect of things um, and like yeah. kind of how that is given to it as a solution. And again, so many of us went down that road, but now you mm-hmm. have two kids. Mm-hmm. How did you manage to, did you reverse like your, your symptoms and start ovulating again? Or what did that, Mm -hmm. um, look like for you? Sure. Yeah. So once I became a dietitian, I worked all these different jobs. I worked in hospitals, I worked in food service. And, um, and then I thought, no, I'm going to open up my own private practice, but the one thing I'm never going to work in is PCOS too complicated, (laughs) too complex. Like I'm not going to touch that with a 60 foot pole. Well, then I realized I did research. I worked in a women's clinic alongside some really, really, really talented OBGYNs and nurse practitioners. And I started to really learn about it. And I started to really learn about the connection between diet and PCOS. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know what, here I am with PCOS, a dietitian struggling. This is actually the best place to work in. And so Um, I really worked hard to get my cycle regulated, not to get pregnant, but just to have more regular periods because there's so many benefits to that. Like we talked about estrogen, progesterone, mood, um, so many things. So I was really working and focused on that. And, um, I was able to get ovulating on a more regular basis, which luckily for me, that was, you know, kind of the main issue when it came to pregnancy, I didn't have any structural abnormalities or, um, you know, egg quality or egg reserve issues. So it was just ovulation. So once I was able to ovulate, then, like I said, you know, a lot of us with PCOS, once we do ovulate pregnancy is possible just for, or just, just like for anybody else. Right. Yeah. That's awesome. That's amazing. Yeah. I love yeah. That. Um, yeah. So if somebody comes to you and they're like, I have, you know, like I, like, I think a lot of people look at the symptoms. Right. And, um, yeah, they're like, I want to lose, like, like, I want to lose the weight or like, I think that that's the biggest thing that I hear. Mm -hmm. Um, and like, Mm -hmm. I'm sure that they probably know that they have PCOS. Do Mm -hmm. you try to get them to shift their mindset around things and look at it from a different perspective versus like, like treating the symptom versus treating like the root cause? Um, yeah, definitely. Mindset is huge. And if we're talking about like weight, weight management specifically, there's such a, a, a backlash in the dietetics community, you know, in, in, in weight loss and talking about weight loss. And I get it like diet culture pushed us to, you know, the other side. And so now a lot of dietitians are too timid to talk about weight loss, but the reality is I'm always going back to research. We have research that shows when warranted, I'm not talking about that five to 115 pound person, when warranted weight loss in women with PCOS can potentially restore ovulation, even five to 10% of your body weight. So that's really something to consider if you're struggling with your PCOS, if you're struggling with ovulation um, and you are looking to lose weight and you have some weight to lose, that could really help your symptoms. So it's, it is a mindset set shift because we always want to be thinking about what we call our internal motivators, right? Like what are we, what motivates us? Is it, um, the fact that I want to lose weight and be able to ovulate so that I can get pregnant and be a mom one day, that's a stronger motivator than I'd like to get into my bikini next week for my bachelorette trip. So we think about, we go back to those motivators and those internal motivators are the strongest and they can drive us to actually make the changes that we need in talking about weight loss and weight management. It can be an effective tool, but it's not the only tool and it's not the only thing, you know, we need to and want to focus on with PCOS. So there's also a way to go about it. You know, we don't need to restrict and eliminate and take out whole food groups. And we don't need to go on this crazy crash diet. We can do things in a way that's comfortable, that feels good, that's sustainable. Since PCOS is for life, we need to pick something that we're going to be able to do long-term and actually enjoy. So there's a, there's a, there's a smart way to go about it. And there's a way to go about it that leads to burnout bill. And I've been there and it's not a fun place to hang. So sustainability. If you're somebody who's like, I'm having like what I described, like I'm having a bagel and then pasta and then, you know, pizza, like for dinner, what's like, 
usually though it's not you don't just like shift to eating eggs and avocado right away like what are your recommendations for somebody who wants to start to build this in but like doesn't really know where to start yeah yeah Yeah, totally yeah definitely so Here's an example. I had a client who would go to Starbucks every morning and get, um, I don't even know what it was. I mean, a lot of their drinks have a lot of sugar in them, which is fine. But every morning, starting your day off with that, with PCOS, um, it was it was not great for her. So we decided to have her just take the sweetener, you know, the pumps of the sweetener down. We cut them in half. It was such a small change, but small changes add up. So then after we were on that for a while, she got used to that, her taste buds adjusted, then we went down to one. So it's really just making small changes as we go along. So if somebody is doing bagel, cream cheese, coffee breakfast, and I'm like, eat eggs and avocado with chia sprinkled on me, you know, they're gonna be like, what are you talking about, you nut? You you really have to go slow. So maybe you, you swap out that cream cheese for avocado if you like it, or have them have them list foods that they enjoy, that they actually like yeah. proteins, carbs, vegetables, God forbid, um, fruits, <laughs> uh, fats, you know, and we go through the categories and we figure out what they actually enjoy. How yeah. do we get more of those rather than taking things away? Because if you take away someone's dearly beloved foods, they're not going to like you and they're not going to stick with it. So totally. you've got to find a way to tweak it that works best for them. Is it going to be perfect right away? No, but you know, you can at least inch closer to that ideal target that you want to be aiming for. Mm-hmm. So I would say, let's, let's try to swap that cream cheese out for like smashed avocado. See how it goes. Don't hate me. See how it goes. See how it goes. And then maybe we add in an egg and then maybe eventually we take the bagel and cut it in half. So you can go slow. There's a way to approach it. That doesn't feel all consuming and too overwhelming. I love that. Mm -hmm. Um, When people start to incorporate these changes, how long does it take for them to notice the results? It's a really good question. And it really varies on the person. It depends on exactly what they're doing. If they're doing multiple things versus just changing their diet, if they're also adding in, you know, a a nice movement routine, working on extra, extra self-care and, you know, stress management, if they're also adding in supplements, Typically, we can see good progress within the three-month mark. Um, Your hormones are stubborn creatures, and they're not going to change overnight. Neither will weight, um, but we can generally make pretty good traction in uh, in the three-month mark. Is there any medical, not medical, but is there any equivalent to PCOS in men, like the that kind of has the same type of symptoms that can cause infertility in men? Uh, I feel like insulin resistance or like, blood sugar issues and you can speak more to this too but like definitely will cause both sexes it's going to cause it's obviously like you guys don't have ovaries and eggs Mm -hmm. and that's not going to be the way that it's affected but yeah please speak to that i know yeah that actually i was on a podcast earlier this morning and she was talking about something called fat, but PHAT, where it's like a metabolic, there's a big metabolic component. I do not know about that. I have, I honestly, I'm like, that's fascinating. Let me write that down and I'll look at it. Not that I know there's no direct equivalent, but I will say that, yeah, pre-diabetes, type 2 diabetes can uh, lead to issues with erectile dysfunction. That can definitely contribute to infertility and also other way, you know, a ton of other things. So there's no direct equivalent, but there's definitely similarities um, when it comes to that metabolic blood sugar piece. Right. So also with PCOS, we're at a higher risk for things like heart disease, um, obviously type 2 diabetes. And, um, and men can have that, you know, same meta, those same metabolic issues too. So, yeah. yeah that's and I'm question. sure that given that, you know, blood sugar impacts, yeah. you know, um, estrogen, all, all of these different things, I'm sure it, 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 you know, there's a way that it's also impacting testosterone production as yes. well. Yes. Um, totally. yeah. So, now that we've kind of gone through all of this, one of the pieces that we, highlighted a little bit, but I want to go a little bit deeper into, um, mm-hmm. is the, the stress piece. And like you're, you've said like, okay, you, you know, your diet movement supplements. So tell us a little bit about how stress influences PCOS is somebody who has high cortisol levels more likely to have issues with PCOS. And if so, why? 
Definitely. So PCOS, we see a lot of adrenal dysfunction and so many of us, our PCOS relies heavily on our stress levels. So if you've ever heard the term um, lean PCOS, I don't know if you've heard of that, but it's basically like a title that we're given if we are not in a larger body size. But to be honest with you, women with PCOS who are lean can still struggle with insulin resistance and testosterone issues. Mm. Um, and we can also still struggle with this adrenal piece and women who are in a larger body size can also struggle with the adrenal piece. So, um, the, the cortisol connection when, um, when our cortisol is elevated, like I mentioned, it can cause the body to hold on to weight and not let it go. It's also a stressor on the body to keep our blood sugar regulated. So just not regulating that can actually increase our cortisol as well. Mm -hmm. And that can cause our periods to stop. Um, there's a big period and cortisol connection and there's whole, you know, the whole concept of like adrenal burnout or adrenal fatigue, you know, however real or whatever that, you know, that looks like in research, um, stress is a real component for stress can drive and exacerbate any health condition that we can possibly think of. And PCOS is not, um, is not exempt from that. So huge connection. You, you really want to prioritize and focus on that piece. Me personally, my PCOS is very stress and adrenal driven. I don't mm -hmm. have the androgen testosterone piece, but I have that potential burnout piece. So I, it's yeah. a good reminder to always stay on top of my stress. What am I doing to make sure I'm taking care of my body and I'm, I'm giving it the TLC that it needs. Um, and so the way that I describe PCOS is that a lot of us, our bodies are basically big drama queens and we overreact to, to common stressors that somebody without PCOS might be able to say, eh, that's fine. Yeah. Uh, we tend to be more type A perfectionist, um, very driven, and that can all kind of also lead us to that burnout town. Yeah. 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 Um, it's funny that you say that when I, it, I think that I know that like now that I, this, I do this for a living, like cortisol is one of those things that touches all of the other hormones. And what I mm -hmm. didn't know back when I had a thyroid issue in my period, mm -hmm. what I was saying was mm -hmm. that my cortisol was like in the fifties in the morning, which is insane. Like mm -hmm. sky high, double the normal limit mm -hmm. that it should have yeah. been. Um, and mm -hmm. in like, yes, I changed my diet. Yes. I did different things, but in mm -hmm. managing stress more effectively, yes. like that absolutely played the biggest role, but I think it's the hardest thing for people to be able to do because it's not tangible. It's like, it's not right. like I'm taking this pill every day or like I'm eating eggs every day. I, how right. it's like, I, it's, you're not yes. as, you know, you can't, you're, you're not there. You're not measuring it. That's a great way to put it, Chad. Um, yes. and so for people yes. out there who are looking to start to try to manage it, cause I think it's, it's whether you have PCOS or not, yeah. I think it's chronic stress is an, a huge problem within our society. And so what Absolutely. are your tips for people who are, who are working on that? Totally. There, there's a lot. Um, and I'll just touch on like one or two, yeah. but one of them would be to figure out what you can take off of your plate. Right. Because if I say, well, what worked for me was I changed my job and, um, all of a sudden my four hour commute that I had two hours there, two hours back, I didn't have that anymore. That significantly cut down on my own personal stress, but somebody else might not be able to just change their job. So figure out what you can take off of your plate, figure out what you can delegate. You know, I talk a lot about that when I'm talking about motherhood and entrepreneurship, what can I delegate to make my life easier? It's, it's going to be different for everybody and be real with yourself. Don't sugarcoat it for yourself. Take a look at what your biggest stressors are and do something about if you can cut them out. Great. But that's not always the case, right? Like my kids, I can't toss them out the window. They're here. They're in my house their stressors. So what can I do to make sure that I'm protecting myself? Um, and it looks different, you know, for everybody, it looks different for everybody, everyone's case, but 
that's my first tip. And, and don't share code with yourself. Be real about what are your biggest stressors? What is driving that? Mm-hmm. Um, my second one is have a self-care system. We talk about that. We way overuse that term. Um, but <laughs> yes. what I mean by that is it's a, it acts as a buffer, right? It acts as a buffer system. And what can, what it can do if you have a solid self-care routine that you're able to consistently integrate into your daily life it can help us become more resilient because we can never stop our our stress. We're always going to have stress in some form, but we can change how our body reacts to stressors. So that buffer system, um, you know, for example, I, I go on a walk when I have my therapy session every week now. That acts as an amazing buffer for me. I look forward to it. I know what's happening. That's just me though. I like to be outside. Pick something that you can do reasonably on at least a semi-consistent basis. Yeah. So I love yeah, that. and it's going to look different for everybody. I think what you said the most about being real with yourself, I think so, so many people, because <laughs> like, like there are women that I work with who would never admit that their kids have stressed them out because they like feel guilty <laughs> about it. And it's like, I, no, it's like, <laughs> let's be real. And like, let's be honest about how we're feeling. Cause then we can actually find a solution yes. for it. So true. So true. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of us feel shame about what stresses us out, but if you're not being real with yourself, you'll never figure out how to make improvements. Totally. Yeah. Um, Where do people find all this knowledge that you've spent, you know, large part of your life collecting and everything? I know you've been on podcasts, obviously like this one and you have a website and we saw your supplement line. Where can, uh, where can people find all this information outside of coaching with you directly? Yeah. So I, um, I'm on social media. I'm on Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, and I have the same handle, the same uh, name on there all across the board, which is the women's dietitian, pretty active on all of those channels, um, working on getting better, uh, uh, YouTube and TikTok, but anyway, (laughs) same. um, Yeah. (laughs) All right. It's like, I only have one for one. Um, so Instagram is where I'm probably most active. Um, and then in my website, same www womensidish.com. Um, and then I also have my supplement line and I don't work with clients one-on-one anymore. I run programs. I run PCOS programs. One is specifically focused on fertility and getting pregnant. And uh, the other is focused on non-restrictive permanent weight loss, but both of them work on PCOS symptom mastery. So really getting to the root of and solving those PCOS symptoms, the fertility pregnancy one also has a weight loss component. If you are trying to conceive and wanting to work on weight loss that you can add on. Um, so I run those a few times a year and they are my babies. I absolutely love running them. They include a membership community where they can interact with me directly and I can answer any question that they have. So I have those. And then I also have a podcast coming out finally, um, this summer. And I actually have a book coming out in 2024, which will be about, you know, finally a science backed book with, you know, about PCOS that gives the right nutrition advice and also has a lot of my, I do a lot of recipe development and cooking. So it has like full meal plans and recipes in the back also. Wow. Really you're busy. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> right. I know. So I'm talking about cortisol. Uh, <laughs> That's amazing. That's amazing. Yeah. I think yeah. people will love this. So thank you so much for your time. Yes. Thank you so much for sharing all of this Absolutely. expert um, information. And I think that people will really appreciate it. We, whether they have PCOS so or not, like this is a great episode for just hormonal hormonal balance in general. So thank you for your time. Totally. For Thanks for having me. Out there to learn a bit more about female body. Exactly. Yes, right. Yes. We need that. Support your women. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> we need that. Thank, <laughs> Thank you y'all so, so much. much. We really hope that you enjoyed that episode. You can follow me on Instagram at wellness by Kelly. And if you're new around here, you can sign up for the WBK seven day free trial where you can get access to all of my low impact workouts, blood sugar balancing, plant-based recipes, and guided meditations all available on wellnessbykelly.com and on the WBK app. Hey, thanks for listening. Please make sure you rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast. You can also connect with us on social media at Wellness by Kelly. Drop us a DM for who you want to hear from.